keeping in tune with God. Okay, we just mentioned that our life uh, is a melody, which is made up of, um, uh, it's music made up of melody <coughs> and harmony. And we mentioned that keeping in tune with God uh, is when we're in daily fellowship, listening to him and following his instructions. We're kind of out of tune when we don't want to uh, hear from God. God is the one who created us for his pleasure. And we looked at Revelation 4 and 11, <coughs> Colossians 1 and 16. Also in Isaiah 43, 21, uh, it says, This people have I formed for my glory. I have formed him, yea, I have made him. In Ephesians 1 and 12, we're told to live for the praise of God's glory. We bring pleasure to God by praising and worshiping the, the way that he wants to be worshipped with all our body, soul, and spirit. And when we're doing what we were created for, that's when we're the happiest. That's when we're in tune with our creator. <coughs> all right, Ephesians 5, this is the main scripture. And I want to read a few verses from there. Ephesians 5, I'm going to read verse 1, 2, 10, and 15 to 21. Ephesians 5. Be imitators of God and follow his example. Walk in love. Try to learn what is pleasing to the Lord. Look carefully how you walk. Live purposefully, worthily, and accurately, making the very most of the time because the days are evil. Therefore do not be vague and thoughtless and foolish, but understand and firmly grasp what the will of the Lord is ever be filled and stimulated with the Holy Spirit. Speak out to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, offering praise with voices <coughs> and instruments, and making melody with all your heart to the Lord. At all times and for everything, giving thanks in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ and to God the Father. Be subject to one another out of reverence for Christ. But the main verse we want to a zero in it on is that one making melody with all your heart to the Lord. King James says making melody in your heart. Amplified says making melody with your heart. Either way, <clears throat> we're to do both of it. We're supposed to make it the melody in our heart, and then what's in our heart is going to come out, right? And so it's going to be with all our heart. All right, God's part in our life melody is the fact that He is the composer. He is not only the composer of our life melody, but he's also the conductor. <coughs> Sometimes the person that, that writes a song or composes something isn't necessarily the one who directs or conducts it. But in, in our life, God not only created us, he not only composed our life melody, but he is the one that is the director and the conductor. <coughs> it's he who decides what is best for us, and it's he who writes the tunes for our individual lives. God has the authority um, to compose our life melody because he's the one that created us. <coughs> Psalm 103 tells us, know and perceive and recognize and understand with approval that the Lord is God. It is he who has made us, not we ourselves, we are his, <coughs> excuse me, we are his people, the sheep of his pasture. And if, if you've ever made or created something, which I'm sure you have, you're the one that, that can decide how that thing is to be used or what its, what its purpose is, what it's supposed to, to do. And so as we recognize that it's God who has created us and the purpose that he had in mind was that we should bring glory <coughs> and praise under his name. Psalm 139 and 6 <coughs> tells us, your eyes saw my unformed substance, and in your book all the days of my life were written before they ever took shape, before there was any of them. <coughs> so we see that God had a, a plan and a purpose for our life even before we came to life. So <coughs> we, each one of us are very important as individuals to God. <coughs> God has the complete authority. He has the right to control us but he doesn't want us to serve him or to play our tune because we have to. He wants us to do it because we love him. <clears throat> he wants to be Lord of everything in our life. 
and he deserves our total obedience and total allegiance. The composer makes all the decisions as to what type of piece he wants, what time signature to use, whether it will be a melody in a major or minor key, <clears throat> how long the piece will be, what the rhythm or tempo will be, everything about it, where there will be rests or where there will be stress points. <clears throat> the composer is the one who has the complete say. He's the master. <coughs> and we want to look at just a few of the <clears throat> components that uh, go into making up music. I'm sure everybody's familiar with a, a piano keyboard, and on the regular piano there's 88 keys. The middle one, middle C, and I'd like to, uh, to liken middle C to Christ in our life, because everything relates to that middle C on the piano, so that in our lives as Christians, everything should center around Christ in our life. He is the most important thing. Luke 10 and 42 says one thing is needful. Mary has chosen that good part which shall not be taken away from her. She had chosen the most important thing of being with and hearing the words of Jesus. Psalm 27 and 4 says one thing have I desired of the Lord and that shall I seek after that I may dwell in the house of the Lord in his presence all the days of my life to behold and gaze upon his beauty the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. So we see that the one most important thing, the central thing, and this was supposed to be my middle C, but it kind of got clouded in, but that's, <laughs> that's C, middle C. <clears throat> the most important thing is having a vital living relationship with Jesus. So there's all kinds of uh, notes and chords in music, different kinds of notes. Some are Whole notes, half notes, quarter, eight, sixteenth, thirty second, on and on. <laughs> All kinds of <clears throat> of different notes for different lengths uh, of time. But it's important for the one that's that's playing the piece to hold them for the exact time that the, the composer wanted, or the piece won't sound like he intended it to sound. <clears throat> and we must keep in in time with the conductor keep our eye on the conductor at all times. Anybody that's sung in a choir or played in an orchestra or in a symphony or any of those things, you know how vitally important it is to keep your eye on the conductor. Because if you're not watching, you not only affect your own self, but <laughs> affect everybody else around you. <clears throat> this year was my first time to attend a symphony orchestra when it came to town. And it was very interesting to see uh, the job that the conductor had trying to keep everybody, the instrumentalists and the, the singers, all together. Florley and I were right in the very front seat so we could watch his every move. <laughs> and at times he had trouble trying to keep one person right in line. And in our life it's important that we keep our eye on God, on the conductor. Because if we make a mistake it doesn't just affect us. We're not an island unto ourselves. It affects all those that, that are connected with us. So it's important. <clears throat> Some notes uh, are, what are passive, other notes are active. The passive notes in music are those that are stable. They're very important notes. You can't have a piece without some passive notes. And you always come back to them. Active notes are less stable and they have to be resolved or have to move on to a passive note from time to time in the song. So I'd like to liken the, the uh, passive stable notes to some of the things that are necessary, needed in our Christian life. The things that we have to have in order to uh, be stable. And we could list many, but the, the four main things that I've, I thought about was prayer, reading the Word, not only reading the Word, but obedience to the Word. And sometimes, at least I find, it's, it's not too hard to read the Word. <laughs> but it's a little bit harder to obey the word. And then we have to be willing to share the word. So there's prayer, talking to God, reading the word, letting him talk to us, being obedient to the word, and sharing the word with other people. These things are, are stable and they are things that are necessary. These are things that we need to practice. Anybody that's learned to, uh, to play a musical instrument knows how, how much practice time is required going over and over and over until <coughs> something becomes 
a habit. It becomes easy to do <coughs> and do it with little effort. These things should should become so much a part of us that we don't stop and think, well, should I pray today or is it necessary to read the Word? They'll just be a, a good habit and we will do them almost automatically. <coughs> Some people think habits all have to be bad. We can have really good habits. A habit is something that's repeated over and over. <coughs> and these are things that that we should learn to repeat and I'm sure each one of us have. Some other things in music uh, is the pitch. And that expresses the relative height or depth of a sound. It is also fixed an absolute value of systems or a system of values. <coughs> when I thought about what is the absolute system of values to us, to me that speaks of the Ten Commandments or the principles in the Sermon on the Mount. These are absolute values that don't change over the years, over the centuries. They remain the same. The, same. the Commandments and the Sermon on the Mount. In music there are also some black dots uh, sometimes they come after notes, sometimes they come after rests. And they add a length of time, half the time that the note or rest would normally be held, they're held half that time again. The uh, composer doesn't just throw a black dot here and there without reason or purpose, and so it is with God in our lives. If we have a black spot up here, he, he's aware of it. He put it there for a purpose, and we're not supposed to uh, try to omit it or pretend it isn't there. <coughs> All the notes have, have um, or most notes have stems or uh, beams on them. And to me, the, uh, the stem, because it's going vertical, represents the fact that we have to have a vertical relationship between us and God. The flags, the little things on the side, uh, flags and, and beams, they are vertical. So we also have to have that relationship between us and people. This is a flag, this is a beam. If one or two or more flags join together, make, make the beam. <coughs> so both of those are horizontal things. So we have to uh, have not only a good relationship between us and God, but also between us and other people. Some notes are tied notes. And that simply means that this note isn't played, it's just held for the, the length of time that the one previously that it's tied to. Sometimes we, we are a silent prayer partner to somebody. We might, our voice might not be heard by that person, but we're on the same wavelength where we extend, or we are an extension of them, a silent prayer partner. <coughs> And there's also uh, syncopation in music where the, the note that is generally weak and doesn't receive an accent does receive the accent. And that makes me think of the scripture in 2 Corinthians 2, or 2 Corinthians 12, 9 and 10, where Paul talks about uh, God told him, My grace is sufficient, my strength is made perfect in weakness. For when I am weak, then am I strong. But not only are there different kinds of notes, there are different kinds of chords. <coughs> and the triad is the most common of chords. Triad is made up of the root, the third, and the fifth. And I like to liken God the Father as the root, the foundation. Without God, there's, there's nothing to build upon. And then when we add the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit witnesses or blends in with God. It says he came to testify of God. That makes a, a nice sound. But if you add the, the third one in there, you've got a, a complete sound. When we have Father, Son, and Holy Spirit all together, it makes a, a complete chord. And that's a, a major chord. If you try to, if you make this third one, less than what it is, it becomes minor and it sounds sad and uh, well, it just doesn't sound, <laughs> sound as pleasant. So to me that speaks that we're not supposed to lessen or diminish Christ in any way. Keep him in his central spot in our life because uh, it will sound depressive and 
things won't just quite be in, in proper order if we don't keep them in his right place. <clears throat> we need the balance of all three to be, uh, so our life can be a complete and harmoniously pleasing to God, the heavenly composer. There are major chords. These are ones that, that flow right along and they sound pleasant to our ears. All of us have a lot of circumstances in our life that, that are pleasant. But there's more chords than that. <laughs> there are minor chords. And they're kind of sad, melancholy tunes and depressing. And each of us also have written into our life melody minor chords. There are times of, of heartache and disappointment, sad times. There are dissonant chords. They are also unpleasant to, to the ear and they need to be resolved rather quickly. To me that represents things that come in our life that are they're hard to handle. They need quick resolution. And Ephesians 4, 26, 27 says, When angry, don't sin, but do not ever let your wrath, your exasperation or your fury last until the sun goes down. Leave no such room or foothold for the devil. And so these kind of things that cause uh, discords need to be dealt with immediately and not held over. There are consonant chords. These are stable and dependable ones. To me that speaks of times of, of faith in our life. And when we're standing firmly on the word, there's something firm and, and stable. There are also some chords that are called complementary chords. They're not complete in their self, but you put two of them together and it makes uh, a complete chord. So we are to, to make up for the lack in another brother or sister. Again in Ephesians 4, verse 32, it says, Become useful and helpful and kind to one another, tender-hearted, compassionate, understanding, loving-hearted, forgiving one another, readily and, and freely as God in Christ forgave you. That's quite a big, big order, but he wants us to, to strive to do these kind of things. <clears throat> and then there's the key signatures. The key signature in a piece of music tells us how many sharps or flats there will be in that piece. And again, it's the composer, it's the songwriter, who decides how many high points and how many low points there will be in any given season of our life. Some notes and, and chords are, are made higher, they're sharpened, or they're augmented, they're stretched. And we have to be willing to let the Lord increase and stretch us as he wants to. Other chords are flattened or diminished, made less. And John the Baptist, when he was speaking of Jesus, said, Jesus must increase, I must decrease. <clears throat> but un unless indicated Otherwise, by the composer, we're, we're to be natural. There's your sharp sign, your flat sign, and your natural sign. Be yourself in God. Don't uh, try to be something else. Play the tune that's written and indicated by the time signature in your particular piece. Some songs are written in a major key, others in a minor key. And sometimes we, we tend to think that major is bigger and better and minor is lesser, unimportant, but that's not so in the mind of the composer uh, because he knows exactly what kind of, of note or what kind of uh, music he wants. The minor ones are just as important to the composer and they add a lot of depth and color. As one author put it, my life is but a weaving between my Lord and me. I do not see the colors. He weaveth steadily. Sometimes he weaveth sorrow, and I, in foolish pride, forget he sees the upper, and I the underside. Not till each loom is silent and the shuttle cease to fly will God unroll the pattern and explain the reason why. The dark threads are as needful in the skillful weaver's hand as the threads of gold and purple in the pattern he has planned. And anybody that's done any quilt work or embroidery or any kind of Needlepoint know that it looks a lot better when you're looking down on the pattern than it does if you're looking up from underneath. And <clears throat> the the author here is telling us that we see we see all the, the knots and the, the black and everything 
as it doesn't look very good from underneath, but God, in his plan, knows exactly where to put those dark streaks that will bring out the depth to the picture that he's doing. In music, there's also tempo and rhythm. These express the time element. They're relative and they're flexible. Rhythm can be simple or it can be compound. And some of the things that God does in our life is very compound, very complex, difficult to understand. Some tunes are played quick and lively, while others are slower. There can be a change of tempo within a tune, and certainly different songs have different tempo. So we should not expect all of our life melody to be in one tempo. We'll have some parts that are that are um, quick and lively, and other parts that are that are slow. But we need to appreciate all parts. There are rests and stress uh, points in songs. And the rests measure the all-important silence between sounds. There are often uh, rests of different lengths in a song. I'd like to read just a short excerpt from an, uh, one of the Streams in the Desert articles. Uh, it was I used the scripture Matthew 14 and 13 where God uh, called his disciples into a desert place. But speaking about the rest, there is no music in a rest, but there's making of music in it. And as I'm reading about the rest, think about the times in your life that you feel kind of uh, inactive or maybe even set on the shelf. In our whole life melody, the music is broken off here and there by rests. We foolishly think we've come to the end of the tune. God sends a time of forced leisure, maybe sickness, disappointed plans, frustrated efforts, and he makes a sudden pause in the choral hymn of our lives. We lament that our voices must be silent and our part missing in the music, whichever goes up to the ears of the Creator. But how does the musician read the rest? See him beat the time with unvarying count and catch up the next note true and steady as if there had been no breaking point in between. He puts the rest exactly where he wants them. Not without design does God write the music of our lives. It's our point, our part, to learn the tune and not to be dismayed at the rests. The rests are not to be slurred over, not to be omitted, not to destroy the melody, not to change the keynote. If we look up, God himself will beat the time full and clear. If we sadly say to ourselves, there's no music in this rest, let's remember that there is the making of music in it. And the making of music is often slow and painful process in this life. But how patiently God works to, re to teach us how long he waits for us to learn the lesson. That's the end of that quote. And then they had a little poem called Aside. <clears throat> called Aside from the glad working of the busy life, from the world's ceaseless stir of care and strife, into the shade and stillness by thy heavenly guide. For a brief space, thou hast been called aside. And if you haven't had one of these called aside times, rest times, I'm sure you will. You probably all have had. And they don't just happen once in a song. Generally, a song has more than one rest time in it. Called aside, perhaps into a desert garden dim, and yet not alone when thou hast been with him, and heard his voice in sweetest accents say, Child, wilt thou not with me this hour stay? Called aside in hidden paths with Christ thy Lord to tread, deeper to drink at the sweet fountain head, closer in fellowship with him to roam, nearer perchance to thy heavenly home. Called aside, O knowledge deeper grows with him alone. In secret oft his deeper love is shown, and learnt in many an hour of dark distress some rare sweet lesson of his tenderness. Called aside, we thank thee for the stillness and the shade. We thank thee for the hidden paths thy love hath made. And so that we have wept and watched with thee, we thank thee for our dark Gethsemane. Called aside, O restful thought, he does all things well. O blessed sense, with Christ alone to dwell. So in the shadow of thy cross to hide, we thank thee, Lord, to have been called aside. So the next time that you, you are in a, quote, rest 
spot in the melody of your life, remember that that God is there. He planned it, and He's with you through all that that time, as well as through the the other more active times. Psalm 37 and 7 tells us, "Be still, rest in the Lord, and wait for Him." Sometimes we don't do that unless He makes us do it. <laughs> and Luke 9 and 10 says. And he, Jesus, took the disciples and withdrew into privacy. He wanted to have a time alone with them. Some songs have lots of rest in them, and some don't have hardly any. But we shouldn't look at another person's life and, and wonder why they don't have any of these <laughs> difficult rest spots, and we have so many. Remember, God is the one that decides. There are stresses and accented points in a song. These are common to all songs. Some tunes have the stresses closer together, and we shouldn't be surprised at the stress points in our life. First Peter 4 and 12 tells us, Beloved, don't be amazed. First Peter 4 and 12, Don't be amazed and bewildered at the fiery ordeal that's taking place to test your quality as though something strange were happening to you. We shouldn't be amazed at the stress points. So we see that God's part is writing the melody. He has the responsibility. He's the, the creator, and it's him who decides um, everything about the song. So what's our part? Our part, first and foremost, I believe, excuse me, our part, first and foremost, is to recognize that God is the composer of our life melody. We know that in our head, but we have to get it into our heart so that when these difficult times come, we still realize that he's in control. He's the composer. He's planned it. God has either planned, purposed, or permitted everything that comes into our life. And if we could really know that beyond a shadow of a doubt, we could have peace no matter what happens, no matter what the Lord puts us through. Philippians 2 and 13 says, Not in your own strength, for it is God who is all the while effectively at work in you, energizing and creating in you the power and desire both to will and to do of his good pleasure, and satisfaction and delight. God is at work in you all the while. Not only do we have to recognize that God is the one that's the composer, but we have to also follow the tune that's written for us. That sounds easy, but it's not easy. <laughs> it's important we don't try to write our own tune. You all know of people, and maybe you've done it yourself, try to do your own thing. We're not to do that. We're to uh, follow the tune that God has written. It's important also that we don't try to play another's tune. We look at somebody else and say, oh, if I was just in their shoes, that would be a cinch. <laughs> but you're not in their shoes. God didn't... Uh, plan you to be in their shoes and if you were there you wouldn't think it was such a sin either <laughs> because each uh, each life has its own difficulties I often think of the uh, little story that's told of, of the uh, the birds that wanted they thought that the other birds wings would be much much more suitable much easier much lighter burden but when they, they put all the wings in, in one pile and let them pick out their own wings and they ended up with the very ones that God had given them in the first place <laughs> because after trying on all the others there was something wrong about them they didn't fit <laughs> so don't try to play another's tune we are each members in particular with individual tunes to sing first Corinthians chapter 12 it talks about us being all members of one body but each with different functions it talks about the ear the eye the hand the foot the heart all necessary parts but we need each other it would be a, a funny body with all eyes or all feet or more of one thing than what god planned would not be right verse 12 of, of chapter 12 tells us for just as the body is a unity all the parts though many form one in verse 18 but as it is god has placed and arranged the limbs and organs in the body each particular one of them just as he wished and saw fit with the very best adaptation and I like to rephrase that uh, to say it's God who has written our life melody and it's he who has uh, placed us as individual notes 
on the staff as it's pleased him. It's saying the same thing on putting it into music instead of into the, the form of the body. In music, there are, are some moves that are called conjunct and others that are disjunct. Ones, the conjunct are steps up and down, disjunct are, are skips up and down. We have to learn how to step up and how to step down, is what it's saying to me. Luke 14, 11 says, He that humbleth himself will be exalted. <clears throat> and then there are um, enharmonics. There are notes that have the same, that sound the same, but look differently. And even if we have the same spiritual or natural gift that somebody else has, it's going to sound differently because we're an individual. There'll be a different administration of that gift. There's also unity and variety in music. To me, the unity speaks of our oneness of purpose, our one goal. Our common goal is to know him and to make him known. The variety, to me, speaks of the diversity in uh, using our gifts, in sharing our gifts, in making him known, the different ways that God uses us in speaking to other people and in presenting his message. But the, the unity is to know him. One songwriter has put it, to know him, to know him is the cry of my heart. Oh, Spirit, reveal him to me. To hear what he's saying, that brings life to my bones. To know him, to know him alone. And the verse of that song says, to walk in his power you must become weak. It's in your weakness that God can be seen. Most gladly will I glory in my infirmities that his power may rest upon me. And the second verse is, if you really want to know him in a way that's complete and into his likeness to be changed is your aim, you'll have to know him in his suffering that you may know him in his love. Then you'll never be the same. Ephesians 4 and 3 says, Be eager and strive earnestly to guard and keep the harmony, the oneness of the Spirit. Ephesians 4 and 3, Keep the harmony and the oneness of the Spirit in the binding power of peace. Every major scale has a relative minor scale. We all need to relate, to communicate with one another. We're all in the same family. We're all related to one another. Hebrews 13 and 16 says, But to do good and to communicate, forget not. For with such sacrifices God is well pleased. We need communication on the horizontal level with fellow Christians and non-believers as well as on the vertical level with God. Do good and communicate. Each scale is related or built upon another scale. We are interwoven. As I mentioned before, no one is an island unto themselves. We're all connected. And then we have responsibility to others, those over us. God has a, um, a grand staff. That's the treble clef and the bass clef. Makes a grand staff. And to me, when I think about a grand staff, I think of, of the leadership in the local church. We are dependent upon them for our placement. They are God's representatives to us. True, it's God who places us, but God uses people as well, his, his leaders, to help in our placement. Hebrews 13 and 17 tells us, Obey your spiritual leaders and submit to them, for they are constantly keeping watch over your souls and guarding your spiritual welfare as men who must give an account for you. So those over us and those side by side with us, how are we to relate to them? In music there's three-part harmony. So to me, uh, the relating to the, per the people side to side with us is working together. It speaks of working together with others in the body of Christ whether it's in our family, in our church, in our community, we are to work in harmony, to work in one accord. <clears throat> Romans 14 and 19 says, So then let us, 
diligently aim for and pursue that which makes for harmony, for mutual upbuilding. It was Romans 14 and 19. First Peter 3 and 11 says, Search for peace, harmony, undisturbedness from fears. Search for it and seek it diligently. In music there are discords. Any note or chord or interval that is unpleasant to the ear. Let's not be guilty of sowing discord among our brethren or sisters. Discord is listed as one of the things that God hates in Proverbs 6 and 19. So there's a false witness who breathes out lies and he who sows discord among the brethren. That's one of the six or seven things that God hates. So let's not be guilty. Sometimes there are dissonant chords that are written in the music. These are times that are unpleasant, things we'd rather not go through. Play them quickly and let them be resolved to a more pleasant chord. Don't dwell on the unpleasant things. Don't, uh, well, just don't dwell on them. They can add depth and color and they can cause us to become compassionate and more understanding of others with the things that we go through, but don't dwell on them. Sound where you're placed on the staff. Don't try to change positions with somebody else. The composer knows best where to place you. He also knows who you'll sound best next to. God doesn't make mistakes in his placements. If he chooses to, to move you to another location, let him, but don't move yourself. Sound where, sound where you're placed and keep tuned up. There's a time for this and a time for that. And we not, should not reverse those times. Ecclesiastes 3, 1 to 8, tells us to everything there's a season and a time for every matter uh, or a purpose under heaven. A time to be born, time to die, time to plant, time to pluck up, and so on. There's a time for everything. In music, there's lots that could be said about time. But the main thing is that you do the right thing for the right amount of time. <laughs> length of time. Isaiah 50 and 5 tells us to speak a word in season, in the right time. <clears throat> and the ways that we can, can uh, keep tuned up are um, basically the, the w things that we need to do to keep stable, keep tuned up by prayer, by reading and obeying the word, and by fellowshipping with other believers. Something else that I believe is important is that we have to watch our motives. In music, there's such a thing, it's spelled exactly like motive, but it's pronounced motif. And a, a motif in music, they're small, important patterns of uh, pitches or rhythm repeated throughout the phrase, throughout the song. But they're, they're what determine the melody. And in our life, if our motives are not uh, pure, if our motives are not right, then the song's just not going to come out right. The melody is not going to uh, be what God intended. We have to continually let our motives be challenged by God uh, so that our uh, life can line up to the, the characteristics that God wants to have in our life, the fruit that he would have. And then how are we to relate to those under us? We should be an example that they can follow. As Paul in 1 Corinthians 11, verse 1 says, Pattern yourself after me. Follow my example as I imitate and follow Christ. It's so important that, that we, <clears throat> as closely as we can, follow Christ because whether we are aware of it or not, there are others that are looking to us and following us. And it's important that we lead them in the right pathway. We should in honor prefer one another, remembering that God has placed both you and the other person just where he wants you. And all parts are equally important. Romans 12 and 10 says, Love one another with brotherly affection as members of one family, giving preference or precedence, showing honor to one another. There's chord progression. We're not always to play in the same chord or the same tune. We're to be changed from glory to glory. 
and to go on to maturity. 2 Corinthians 3 and 18 says, And all of us with unveiled face continue to behold in a mirror the glory of God. And we're constantly being transformed, transfigured, changing from glory to glory. In music there's also ear training. And that's something that I'm, I'm learning is very important. To learn, we must listen to hear God speak, to be able to recognize his voice. And it comes with practice. And it's one thing in theory class I'm having difficulty with, hearing <laughs> the right notes and recognizing the intervals. <clears throat> it takes practice to become accurate. And so in, in our spiritual life, it takes practice listening and being able to discern what's God's voice, what's God's spirit speaking, what's our own human spirit, or what's the evil spirit. And uh, this, almost five years ago now, I, I wrote this a poem that says, God speaks, do I hear? God often speaks, but sometimes it's unclear. Was that you, Lord? Did I really hear? If closer to him I'd be at times like these, I'd not have to say, repeat that, please. <laughs> if I listen closely while his word I read, often he'll say, this is what you need. I'm speaking to you. Don't turn me aside, but let my word speak in you abide. If I ignore and pass to other things, his voice is stilled. His presence takes wings. I believe in this way his spirit I grieve, and although he loves, he seems to leave. He doesn't really leave, but it seems like it. But if I'll pause at first indication, reread, and meditate with concentration, Maybe a word of reproof he to me will give. If to him I respond, I'll grow and live. Maybe a word of encouragement is what I need. If I'll take time, his still voice to heed. Letting him speak and deal in his own way, more courage I'll have to face a new day. If to his voice I've not responded yet, he's many ways my attention to get. Like closing doors of opportunity, or at times through a friend, he'll speak to me. In my own life, I found it easier to be when my Lord speaks directly to me. But if a deaf ear to his voice I turn, he'll thunder loudly until obedience I learn. Lord, the desire of my heart as seen by me is to remain close enough to thee that when you choose to speak a word to me, I'll hear you clearly and obey immediately. And that's still my prayer. How do we hear God? <clears throat> Through much practice of listening. I'm still learning to listen. Through personally reading and studying the scriptures with an open mind. Through we hear God through messages that we hear in church and home group and women's study group and so on. Sometimes we hear him speak through a caring friend, maybe through a prophetic word, and through stilling our spirits and allowing God to speak spirit to spirit in dream or in vision, nighttime as well as daytime. I don't know how much um, emphasis you put on, on dreams, but if you're interested in a, in a good little paperback, uh, there's a book that's called Your Dreams, God's Neglected Gift. It's just two, three dollars. A year ago now, or a little bit later, when that fellow from out, out east was here and was mentioning about dreams, and he gave some illustrations, and then since then I, I found this book. I think he referred to this one, but uh, I found this one, and, and it, it's very interesting. And when you're aware that God can speak in, in your dreams, then you, you're open to him to do that. A lot of people say, well, I never dream. We, we dream a lot, but aren't conscious of it. But if we're aware and let the Lord know that that we'll let we'll let Him speak to us in our dreams, then we'll be uh, more open to hear Him. And sometimes He tells us things we don't want to hear, because often often He'll reveal blind spots that we didn't really know we had. But 
He'll speak if we'll let him. <coughs> Psalm 16 and 7 says, I will bless the Lord who has given me counsel. Yes, my heart or my spirit instructs me in the night season. And I believe that that is one way that he does it to us in the night is through our dreams. Okay, not only is there uh, ear training, but there's also sight singing. We're commanded many times in the scripture to sing to the Lord. A lot of the Psalms bear this out. Just to mention a few, Psalm 98 and 1. Oh, sing to the Lord a new song, for he has done marvelous things. Sing. Psalm 33 and 3. Sing to him a new song. Play skillfully on the strings the loud and joyful song. That was 33 and 3, Psalm 40 and 3. He has put a new song in my mouth, a song of praise to our God. But in sight singing, we have to learn to sing exactly and only what's written, only what you see. Don't just go off where you think it should be, but read the music. Jesus only did what he saw the Father doing, and he only said what he heard the Father saying. In John chapter 8, Verses 26, 28, 38. Jesus speaking says, I tell the world only the things that I have heard from God. I do nothing of myself, of my own accord or on my own authority, but I say exactly what my Father has taught me. I tell the things which I have seen and learnt at my Father's side. I have told you the truth that I have heard from God. And if God, if Jesus himself, had to be so careful as to say and do only what God told him how much more we should be careful to only say and do the things that we hear God saying and telling us to do <clears throat> that which we have seen and heard declare we unto you so how how do we see God I believe we can picture him in our mind with the eyes of our heart Ephesians 1 and 18 says, By having the eyes of your heart flooded with light, so that you may know and understand the hope to which he has called you, and how glorious inheritance in his saints. By picturing in our minds with the eyes of our heart, by picturing what you're, when you're reading the word, put yourself in the story and feel how they felt. Hear what they heard see what they saw by picturing yourself um, in through the worship songs that you're singing like when we're singing majesty in your mind's eye you can you can picture the Lord upon the throne and everyone including yourself bowing down and worshiping him or standing with hands raised picturing in your mind uh, at least to me helps to make it more real and also when we're praying for someone, we can uh, ask the Lord to, to let us see what he's doing in that person's life, what he wants to do, and what we can do to uh, assist him, to be his hand extended to that person. Not too long ago, I was praying for a certain person and asking the Lord to, to show me what he was doing in her life. And what I saw was, was a, a shepherd holding a little lamb. And, and then the Lord gave me something that I could share with her along that, that line. And by seeing what, what the Lord was doing, we were able to cooperate what he's doing and not, uh, not go a different way, <laughs> but be effective in what we say and what we do. <clears throat> Mark Verkler, he's the, the author of Communion with God, if you've taken that course in CITW. I have another book of his that, that's very similar. It's called Dialogue with God. And in chapter 5 of that, he says that there are prerequisites to receiving communication from God through vision. And this is what he lists as the three prerequisites. Be convinced of the value of dream and vision. Set aside time to deliberately offer the eyes of your heart to God. By that, he means to... Uh, in your devotional time to quiet yourself and to ask God Father is there anything you want to show me and then just just wait 
and look to see, wait quietly and expectantly with your mind focused on Jesus. We can communicate with him only by faith. So the three things that, that he says are prerequisites to receiving communication through vision is be convinced of the value of vision, dreams, set aside time to deliberately offer the eyes of your heart to the Lord, and then look to Jesus, waiting quite quietly and patiently for him. Habakkuk 2 and 1 says, I will, this is the Amplified, I will in my thinking stand upon my post of observation. I'll station myself in the tower and I will watch to see what God will say within me. It doesn't say I'll listen to hear what God's going to say. He says, I will watch to see what God will say. And to see what God's going to say, you're going to have to see, you're going to have to picture him in your mind. <clears throat> Habakkuk goes on to say, And the Lord answered me and said, Write the vision. Here we see that there was a deliberate act of going to a specific place that Habakkuk did. And each of us, I think it's important that we uh, have a definite place that we can can go to and in our in our thinking stand upon that 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 place and watch to see what God will say. We can encounter God in visions of our mind as we meditate upon the Word of God and focus upon Jesus. In utilizing our visionary capacity, we're presenting the eyes of our heart before God, asking Him to fill them. Our capacity to hear and see on a spiritual level can be seen as the two primary spiritual senses used to interact with God. One time when I was just reading about, uh, about the eyes of our heart, I was asking the Lord, well, what's the value of the eyes in my heart? And this is, this is what uh, I feel he said. As you open the eyes of your heart, child, my will in a situation becomes more clear. When you see what just what I'm doing, you could cooperate with me without fear. When I lived upon earth and walked among men, I did only what I saw my father doing. I did not express my own thoughts, but said only what God was saying. If the eyes of your heart are not open, you'll walk all through this life as one who's blind. You'll be frustrated with this, question that as my will you struggle hard to find so take time to relax my precious child quiet yourself and focus your eyes upon me as you are still real still in my presence I'll speak to you just wait and see <clears throat> we also have to remember that God will help us if we ask him to not only is he the composer not only does he want us to play the tune that he's written for us, but he wants us to remember that he'll help us with whatever we need help with. He doesn't ask us to do something without supplying the um, ability and the equipment that we need to do. God will help us to learn how to do our part, learn how to sing or to play the melody that he's written for us, if we but ask him to. Psalm 86 and 11, Teach me your way, O Lord. Psalm 32 and 8, I, it's the Lord speaking, I, the Lord, will instruct you and teach you in the way that you should go. He's more willing to help us than we are even to, to ask. But sometimes, I know for myself, sometimes I hesitate to ask. It's me again, Lord. <laughs> but he wants to help. Teach me to do your will. And Micah 4 and 2 says that he may teach us his ways. Another poem, Teach me, Lord, to pray, to pray in such a way as to reach you, that I may know for certain all you have promised you surely will do. Prayer is a very powerful tool that you have given to us to use. May we treasure communion with you and never take it lightly or its importance abuse. Teach me, Lord, to listen, to listen closely to all that you say, that I may have assurance 
of what your will is for me day by day. I want to recognize your voice whether you speak loudly, whether you speak quietly or loud. Then when I know beyond every doubt, help me to obey, whether alone or in a crowd. Teach me, Lord, to obey, to speak forth all that you'd have me to say. May I speak your word in love to whomever you'd have me to today. May I never fear nor hold back because of what others may say or do but boldly speak forth what you have given that I may encourage others and bring glory to you. And when, we, when we did the Communion with God course in, in Mackenzie, a little course that God gave at the very beginning of the, of the study was very simple. It says, Call unto me and I will answer you. Call unto me great and mighty things I'll do. If you'll just come and bring to me the burdens of your heart, I'll undertake, it will be done, and you'll have had a part. And it's great to have a part in what God is doing. In all music, there's, there's um, what's called the tension and release principle at work. And to me, this speaks of intercessory prayer burdens that God places upon us. As we're obedient and pray a situation or a person through, there is a release of God's power into that situation. It's spiritual warfare, not pleasant to the physical body, but very rewarding and satisfying to the spirit when we see God undertake and know that we've had a part. In conclusion, I just want to say that let's determine to live our life as a harmonious, accurate melody unto the Lord on a daily basis. And this can only be accomplished as we keep in close contact with the composer, with the conductor God, and make sure that we know our part, our tune, and that we play or sing that particular part that God has chosen for us. Let's not be afraid of the high notes, the joyful notes, or the sad, low minor notes, because all, all different kinds are needed to produce the overall picture, the complete life melody, the effect that the composer intended. Life isn't all one monotonous melody. It's made up of various melodies. The trick, or that which requires practice and learning on our part, is to be able to make a smooth transition from one to another and to keep overall peace, joy, and thankfulness no matter what tune has been written for us and no matter how many rests or stress points he includes in our part. As each of us play the tune that God's arranged for us, together we can make a beautiful symphony. And I like that song that says, Lord, make me an instrument, an instrument of worship. But I like the second, song, the second verse best of all. Lord, make us a symphony, a symphony of worship. It's easier to sing or to do something all by yourself. It takes more skill and more concentration and more of everything, I think, <laughs> to do it together as a, as a symphony. And I think that that uh, is very pleasing to God when we uh, do not only our part, but are willing to be part of a whole, of a big symphony. And another verse that uh, just this week I added to that same tune, Lord, you have made me. You've made me in your image. You've made me to sing forth your praise. Lord God, you've made me, made me in your, your image. So now I do sing forth your praise. Not only recognize that God has made us to sing forth his praise, but to determine that we will do our part, that we will sing forth his praise. 